Hey guys, Britt here. Welcome to End Times Bible Prophecy. Today we're going to talk about a number of news headlines, both directly and indirectly related to Bible prophecy. So let's dig right in. The first one I'm going to pull up, this is from oilprice.com, and it's titled, Iran and Russia Move to Create a Global Natural Gas Cartel. It says, the $40 billion Memorandum of Understanding signed last month between Gazprom and the National Iranian Oil Company is a stepping stone to enabling Russia and Iran to implement their long-held plan to be the core participants in a global cartel for gas suppliers in the same mold as OPEX for oil suppliers. With the foundation and the current Gulf Exporting Countries Forum, this gas OPEC would allow for the coordination of an extraordinary proportion of the world's gas reserves and control over natural gas prices in the coming years. Occupying the number one and number two positions in the world's largest gas reserves table respectively, Russia with just under 48 trillion cubic meters and Iran with nearly 34 trillion cubic meters, the two countries are in an ideal position to do this. So we saw this last month. We saw where Russia and Iran inked this huge deal where Gazprom is going to go into Iran and off the coast of Iran and really build up its infrastructure for natural gas exploration and extraction. And this is part of a plan. As if you read through this whole article where they are teaming up and their goal is to be the dominant providers of natural gas supplied over land via pipeline and over the seas via liquefied natural gas. And one of the ways, one of the keys to doing this is they're trying to bring Qatar into their fold. They are the number three natural gas producer in the world and have up until recently, I'm thinking the United States supplanted them with its exports to Europe, but up until recently they were the number one exporter of liquefied natural gas in the world. And so if these three countries can team together and they're going to try to put together other nations into their orbit of influence, then they can create an OPEC for natural gas and control the price globally. And essentially, be in a position over the world similar to the position that Russia occupies right now in relation to Europe and being able to squeeze Europe. They've got Europe held hostage. They can name their price because without the natural gas coming from Russia, Europe has no way to fuel its energy needs, at least based on the policies that they've implemented. So. What does this mean? Well, it means we see the Russia-Iran alliance that was spoken of in Ezekiel 38 and 39 strengthening, coming closer together and becoming more powerful, becoming, putting themselves in position to become a global energy powerhouse. And this also would raise questions of the purpose of the Gog of Magog invasion which Ezekiel 38 and 39 tells us that Gog invades Israel in order to take plunder. Well, what is that plunder? Some have speculated that it may be the natural gas fields off the coast of Israel, which have been found in recent years, which continue to go upward in their projections. We saw a recent deal inked between the European Union and Israel and Egypt to supply natural gas to Europe. It's a tiny fraction of what Russia sends to Europe, or has sent to Europe in the past. But could that change? Could that change in the months and years ahead? And if it does, that might provide the motive in Russia's case for why they would do that. It, may, it also explains if, if this is the aim of Russia to create this OPEC of natural gas, might explain why they've changed from a position of neutrality in recent years when it's come to Israeli uh, flights into Syria to bomb Iranian targets and why they've completely changed their tune on that and are now calling out Israel on that, taking a belligerent stance toward Israel. And so we want to keep an eye on this. This is definitely 
a possibility for how we may see that play out. Moving on to the next article, we see here we've got this from Zero Hedge. It says, European Central Bank says cash, not fit for digital economy, dismisses central bank digital currency privacy concerns. In the digital economy, cash is no longer a useful tool and a central bank digital currency is the quote, only solution to continue the existing monetary system, according to a new paper from the European Central Bank. The Eurozone's Central Bank recently published a paper titled The Economics of Central Bank Digital Currency. Authors assessed the implications for the financial system and examined data privacy and digital payments. Researchers concluded that a CBDC like a digital euro would be the only solution to facilitate a, quote, smooth continuation of the present monetary system. And then it says, ultimately, cash possesses large economic cost without clear benefits. So it is by construction not fit for the digital age. So what they're doing here is they're pushing this idea that in a digital age, why are we dealing with this Neanderthal, Neanderthal paper currency and passing this around from one person to another? Don't you want the convenience of these electronic payments? And they're trying to fence us off. So we go on, it reads further, it says, digital money might generate privacy concerns, authors warned. However, researchers say that there is a privacy paradox Consumers will emphasize an importance to privacy in surveys, but they will give away their personal data for free or in exchange for small rewards. Now, keep in mind, under the current system, if you want to use a credit card or hand over your data in exchange for something or use cash, you have those choices. The system they're proposing is not in addition to but instead of meaning central bank digital currencies would become the primary and only means of being able to transact in the global economy so you wouldn't have the choice of using cash the cash is going to go away in fact the cash is already starting to go away as you've seen so many countries put limits on the amount of cash that you can deposit or withdraw from a bank how much you can use in different transactions so they've already started this. People have already started to move toward electronic forms of payment. And so this is going to be a place where there's a, a they're going to fence us off from using any alternative system other than the central bank digital currency. And if you have any doubt about that, you just read a little bit further. And here in bold, it tells us what their real aim is. It says, the paper also rejected cryptocurrencies and stable coins, calling them a, quote, threat to monetary sovereignty. Keep that in mind. We'll go down here where we read a quote from the U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell. He says, one question around central bank digital currencies is do we want a private stable coin to wind up being the digital dollar? I think the answer is no. And that's the key, guys. Here's the thing. They are afraid that something like Bitcoin, not necessarily Bitcoin, but something like Bitcoin, a private, decentralized cryptocurrency that can't be controlled by a government, that transcends borders, that is beyond their control, will become the preferred means of transacting business that puts the power in the hands of the people. And they do not want that. If that happens, then the current monetary system, as they said here, they, in bold, threat to monetary sovereignty, the monetary system, they said earlier, will be under threat if that is allowed to happen. Why do they want this current monetary system? Because this mer current monetary system allows them to print at will so they can get social programs and stimulus checks and huge military expenditures and pork barrel kickbacks to all of their friends and it's a it's a money machine in a sense of they can just print it and spend it but you and I ultimately pay for it in the form of inflation so the current monetary 
regime is based on this paper currency. They want to take it digital and fence us in so that there's no other system that we can use to transact business. And once they have us there, we're caught. We're, we're stuck in that cage and we can't get out. And then they can use that to control us. I mean, that's what this is ultimately about. Revelation 13 tells us about the mark of the beast, and without it, no one is allowed to buy or sell. Central bank digital currency technology is most likely to be a part of that mark of the beast system and the means by which global government uses to be able to control people and cut them off from the system, just as we've seen with the Canadian Trucker protesters were cut off from their bank accounts. They'll be able to cut out people who are considered political threats or threats to monetary sovereignty. They can just cut you out of the equation and then what are you gonna do? How are, unless you're, mo most people are not living on a farm completely self-sufficient. Even then you still have to pay taxes to the government. So most people are not self-reliant enough to be able to live outside of that system. So once that happens, they've got us. So along those lines, I highly recommend that you check out this video series right here. This is called Mike Maloney's Hidden Secrets of Money. And he has several episodes where he goes through the history of money because in this past article we were just reading, they were talking about money, 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 money. But they're not really talking about money. They're talking about currency. Currency is this little pieces of paper and promises, and it does not hold its purchasing power. What is money? Well, Mike Maloney argues that it's gold and silver. You could say that it's other real objects that can't simply be printed. But I highly recommend checking out the series because it's going to help you understand where we're going in this world of fiat currencies because for the first time in human history these past 50 years every nation in the world operates on this fiat currency standard mean, meaning their currency is not backed by anything and if all of those currencies fail at the same time which all fiat currencies in human history have always failed they all fail at the same time what does that do to the global economy what does that do to the global order and who is there to pick up the pieces? That's the ultimate question. So on to this next story. This one's from Yahoo. It says more than 20 million Americans are behind on their utility bills. More than 20 million households, about one in six American homes, are currently behind on their utility bills. Those households owned a, owed a combined 16 billion in unpaid utility bills, double the pre-pandemic total. The average balance owed has climbed 97% since 2019. Mostly to blame, according to Bloomberg, is a surge in electricity prices propelled by the soaring cost of natural gas. So we have gas shortages put in place by some of the policies that have been adopted that are driving up the prices for basic utilities, electricity, natural gas, our energy, our basic energy needs. And of course, this is driving up cost of food along with the currency printing that they're engaged in and so rising energy cost rising food costs that's going to crush the poor and middle class and it's going to make us ripe for demagogues and the rise of some nefarious politicians and this is going on globally we see this in greece it says this is from yahoo as well and it says Greece, 1.9 billion euro subsidy for September power hikes. Greece's government plans to provide 1.9 billion euros in subsidies next month to help households and businesses cope with increasing electricity prices. We also see this in the UK. This is from BBC News. It says, lives at risk without more help on energy bills. Lives will be at risk this winter, experts and charities have warned after the energy regulator hiked the price cap on household bills by 80%. A typical household gas and electricity bill will rise to £3,549 a year from October. Save the Children said young people's health was at risk and money expert Martin Lewis predicted grave consequences without more state help. So what is that state help? Are they going to produce more energy? 
know what they're going to do, what Greece is doing, what UK looks like they're going to do, what the United States is most likely to do, is they're going to say, we're, we're from the government and we're here to help you. And we're going to do that by giving you more currency, right? So they're going to hand out, let's say it's $1,000 a month in uh, STEMI checks to help with rising food and energy cost, right? Because we're for the little guy. Well, what that does, if you have a basic supply and demand situation where, you know, energy is going down, the supply of energy is going down, we're seeing shortages because of government policies, but the demand is going up because we're handing out currency, we're subsidizing that demand rather than letting the free market take place. Well, then you're going to see prices go up, you're going to see more shortages, more price inflation. And this is going to be a vicious cycle where then they say, well, now people really can't afford it. Now we need $2,000 stimulus checks, then $3,000, $4,000, $5,000. And we're going to end up with a hyperinflationary scenario where everything, the whole global economy just falls apart. So that's ultimately where this is headed. I don't know how long it'll take for that to happen. I personally think we're going to head into a depression, a global depression, in the next six months and that the response to that from the politicians is going to be all of this currency printing as they hand that out to try to buy votes and that's going to create massive hyperinflation and the whole system is going to fall apart so we'll see whether or not that happens when it happens i think somebody is going to be there to pick up the pieces i think that likely person is going to be the antichrist now, next up, we see this from Zero Hedge. It says, China's water crisis could trigger global catastrophe. China's water crisis is nothing new, but it's gotten worse and is now on the brink of catastrophe and could trigger a global catastrophe, according to foreign affairs. Given the country's overriding importance to the global economy, potential water-driven disruptions beginning in China would rapidly reverberate through food, energy, and materials markets around the world and create economic and political turbulence for years to come. For starters, there's no substitute for water, which is essential for food production, electricity generation, and sustaining all life on Earth. In China, which consumes 10 billion barrels of water per day, approximately 700 times its daily oil consumption, Decades of economic and population growth have pushed northern China's water system to unsustainable levels. According to the report, the per capita water supply around the North China Plain at the end of 2020 was nearly 50% below the UN's definition of acute water scarcity. So we're seeing this problem. This is, this, these droughts in China are affecting their food production. It's affecting their ability to generate electricity and that in turn is causing factories to have to shut down which causes more supply chains throughout the world and of course we scroll down here and the food prices their food that's a big deal so it's the result of a worsening drought will of course mean less food and it says water is being pumped from farms faster than nature can replenish it if the north china plain suffers a 33 percent crop loss due to water insufficiency China would need to import roughly 20% of the world's internationally traded corn and 13% of the world's wheat. So keep this in mind. China produces a lot of food, but they consume pretty much all of it. They have the world's largest population. So if they take a hit to their food production due to this drought, they either have famine and starvation or they go into the open market assuming that exports of food were still available and they buy those up at any price in order to try to avoid that revolution from taking place from people starving, which ultimately means that the poorest countries in the world, they won't be able to afford that food. The prices will be too high and we'll have famine and starvation there. And Jesus said famine is one of the indicators, a sign that his return is near see this happening in other places and this is from Breitbart it says global food crisis 50% crop loss likely due to drought German farmers say it says crop losses of up to 50% are now expected in parts of Germany due to drought farmers in effective re regions have claimed 
we see this massive drought. It's a generational drought taking place in Europe right now. It's really having a huge impact on crop production. And again, we have the same circumstance in, as we do in China where we have some of the wealthier countries in the world, if they can't grow that food themselves, they're gonna look to import that food, which means that you know, there's only so much food to go around. You can't, just with the handing out of currency that the governments are involved in, they can hand out all the currency that they want. That doesn't produce more energy and it doesn't produce more food. These are real items that either exist or they don't. And if you've got, it's, a, it's, it's like a game of musical chairs. If there's, if there's enough food to go around for four people, but five people want it, somebody's not getting that food and this is going to cause a massive global food crisis at the end of this year and well into 2023 and it's only going to get worse as this article indicates this is from farming uk it says cf fertilizers halts ammonia production at uk plant cf fertilizers has announced its county durham plant will temporarily halt production of ammonia due to rocketing energy prices. At current natural gas and carbon prices, CF Fertilizers said its ammonia production was uneconomical, with marginal cost above 2,000 pounds per ton and global ammonia prices at about half that level. The suspension of ammonia production also means that the Billingham plant will cease to produce CO2, which is a byproduct of the ammonia production process. CO2 is an essential ingredient in food production and food processing, with slaughterhouses and processing plants relying on it to process and package food. So we're seeing the energy crisis seep over into industries, shutting down these industries, making them uneconomical to run. They aren't globally competitive. They're shutting down. And so in this case, we're going to have less fertilizer, which means less fertilizer to grow food with which means a year or two years from now we're going to have less food production because the yields won't be there because the fertilizer won't be there. And we also see that there's going to be less CO2 and that's critical to the food supply chain. So this energy crisis is rippling throughout the world, throughout all global markets, and particularly within the food supply chain. And we're the news isn't getting any better as we look at more and more of these developments. So guys, we brought, we've been over this before with the coming famine, the coming severe food crisis that we're going to face later this year. You need to be getting prepared, get yourself prepared, your family prepared, your neighbors prepared. Just prepare for it because we don't, we don't know what we're going to have to endure with this. This is going to be a, a dark winter as we go into the latter part of this year, not just for Europe with its energy prices and its energy shortfalls and the drought and everything else, but it's this is going to be a global issue as we're seeing. So as a, again, I know this sounds like a bunch of bad news, bad news after bad news after bad news, but remember the best news is that Jesus Christ lives and Jesus is coming back. So he is our hope. He is the source of our joy. So we can look to him in the midst of all this crisis. Jesus says, in this world, you'll go through many trials and tribulations, but take heart because I have overcome the world. So guys, like this, share this, and God willing, we'll talk on Monday. Bye. If you want to learn more about the end times and Bible prophecy, make sure to sign up for my free monthly newsletter and get your copy of my free ebook, Seven Signs of the End Times. Just follow the link in the description to get your free book. Also, make sure to check out all of my books. Just look up Brit Gillette on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple iBooks, Google Books, Kobo, or anywhere books are sold. Thanks for watching today, and until next time, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith.